Finding Growth in Conflict, Good in Failure. The interview with Parker Palmer is coming up, but first, one message. Looking for a small group curriculum for your church that really works? Living Compass is brand new, and it offers a way to bring real transformation into your congregation. Living Compass focuses on wholeness and wellness, and you can check them out at livingcompass.org. Okay, here's your program. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Yaw. Welcome to Church Next. This is a place where energetic Christians come to hear from experienced mentors, from people who've got a passion for healthy congregations. And today we're joined by a man whose life and ministry has been dedicated to wholeness. Parker Palmer is a well-known author, teacher, educator, and conference leader. Years ago, a national survey of 10,000 educators named Dr. Palmer as one of the 30 most influential senior leaders in higher education. Parker's got a great interest in the health of all who serve in the helping professions, especially church leaders. And Parker, let's begin right there. Welcome to Church Next. And can you begin by telling us what kinds of things that you're seeing today in Christianity that are encouraging to you? Well, I think, I think the encouragement, Chris, is, um, comes in the form of individuals I know, individual pastors and individual lay people, who are really hanging in with the very difficult challenge of church renewal, especially in the mainline Protestant traditions in which I grew up and <clears throat> which historically have been so important to this country and, and now, as we all know, are declining in, in numbers and often torn up by internal strife of one sort or another. So I'm not sure that there is any um, particular congregation or set of congregations, probably just because I don't know that much about the church scene around the country. I'm sure good things are happening on a communal basis as well. But in my own personal experience, it's those individuals who have a vision and who are working hard for that vision and trying to rally others around that flag. Sure, and I, I think a lot of what's happening in the church is, is can benefit from, from a lot of the work that you've done in that we are going through a time of great transition, of institutional change, of, of uh, having to invent and reinvent. And I think a lot of us wonder, what are the kinds of gifts, skills, and attitudes we need to be taking with us as we, um, as we live in community with others uh, through a time of change? Well, that's a great question, and it's a big question, of course. A couple of things come very quickly to mind. Um, one thing I think that we need to understand is that community always means conflict, and conflict is not the, the end of community. Conflict is the doorway into deeper community. And I think if we had more leader, leaders, church leaders, and ordained uh, folk, uh, lay leaders and ordained folk who understood that and were able to create settings and help people develop the sensibilities necessary um, to negotiate conflict in a in a hopeful way, um, we'd be a lot better off than, than we are today. So I, I think one thing we need is, is that um, is, is a kind of gratitude for those moments of conflict when something deeper might, might open up between us. Um, as you know, I think, Chris, I've worked a lot in recent years with this whole notion of heartbreak and the notion that there are two ways for the heart to break. It, it can break apart into a million pieces, um, sometimes get hurled like a fragment grenade at the ostensible source of its pain, and there's a lot of that going around. But I think right at the heart of the Christian tradition uh, is this notion that the heart can also break open into greater capacity. And conflict gives us an opportunity to exercise that heart muscle, if you will, uh, to make it more supple and to give it a chance to open in a way that makes it able to hold more of the world's suffering and more of the world's joy. So that's, that's one thing that comes quickly. And a second one I, I'd name just very briefly is, I think we need to fight against um, this sort of secular attitude that um, scarcity is the, the law of the land mm -hmm. or the, the constant state of the human condition, that we never have enough um, and, and that, that the answer always lies somewhere outside of us in accumulating more money, more people, 
more power, whatever the more may be. I, I really believe that the gospel is a gospel of abundance, um, not, not cheap abundance. You don't wave a magic wand and make this happen, but it's about people feeding each other in community. And it's about learning to count resources and assets other than money and strength of numbers and influence and access and power. Um, I remember years ago working with a small cluster of Episcopal parishes down in Texas who were shrinking in membership and therefore their budgets were going downhill as well and they were they were in a kind of doomsday attitude, what seemed to me to be a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy uh, that we're going to disappear. And the, the longer you cling to that, the more likely that prophecy is to come true. I suggested to them that they might uh, do double bookkeeping, which of course technically is illegal, but what I meant by that is keep a second set of books on the human resources that are represented by the people in your congregation. Start identifying and sharing those resources with each other, an asset-based approach to church growth and, um, and renewal. And they, they did that and actually started stabilizing their memberships and started growing because what, 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 people, what attracts people to the church, I think, is that sense of resourceful community that's so hard to come by in, a, in an individualistic, competitive society that's just riddled with, with uh, capitalism, I guess, at almost every level, a sort of survival of the fittest. Um, I, I remember uh, reading in seminary about an ancient historian um, who, who said that what drew people to the early church was looking in and being able to say, see how they love one another. And I think that that remains just as true today as it was uh, in the fourth century. And, and, and changing those attitudes, you know, when, when we talk about a church that perhaps had 800 and is, is down to 100 now, and you have people who are there for much of the ride, they, they throw their arms in the air and they say, oh my goodness, this is horrible. But if you had 20 people and now you have 100, you know, all of a right. sudden you begin to see, oh my goodness, this is really... So, so doesn't a lot of it uh, have to do with the kind of adjusting our, our minds to say, gosh, you know, our job isn't really to lament the people who aren't here but to, to, to live into the abundance that we, we really do have. Well, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think as individuals, we know, at least I, I've certainly experienced this in my life, that when I get fat and happy, I stop growing. I stop learning. I stop feeling the challenge um, that, that I think we're all called to step into. It, it's when I struggle. It's, it's when I fail. It's, it's when things seem to be falling apart, that I have to start digging deeper in myself and reconsider the possibilities and, and renew the energy to engage with life. And I, and I think that the same is true for communities as it is for individuals. You know, I, I think one of the reasons that you, you've, uh, for your popularity, Parker, is, is, is the ways that you um, challenge us to find hope in um, in, in, in places where others would say there's no hope, um, in ways that uh, we look at failures as opportunities to discover a blind spot we never knew we had, um, which could have led to even, even something even worse. Um, but I, I guess what I'm getting at is, is a way of looking at the wholeness of life, um, especially from a Christian perspective, that um, nothing that's happening to you is, is going to be of any long-term harm because you're held in God's hand and it's a way to kind of shape you. Yeah, I, I think we do float in an ocean of grace and uh, sometimes we start flailing because we forget that that ocean is buoyant and will hold us up uh, just, just as the salt water is capable of doing. Um, I think that's, a, that's absolutely true and very important to just keep going back to home base on that one. It, as you know, Chris, uh, from some of my writing, um, I've uh, been through three uh, serious experiences of clinical depression in my life. And I have to say that while I would not wish that on anyone, and I certainly would not invite it back into my own life, 
Um, those three prolonged periods in deep darkness um, have been some of the most important schools of the spirit that I've ever been through. This kind of stripping down um, that uh, forces you back to basics. Uh, this 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 kind of disillusionment um, with yourself and your and and with the world, which uh, disillusionment being a word that really intrigues me. I mean, when normally when someone comes to us and says, "I'm so disillusioned," we put an arm around them and try to comfort them and say, "Oh, I'm so sorry." We really should say, "Congratulations, uh, you've lost an illusion. How how can I help you lose another one?" And how can you help me lose some of my illusions about myself and the world as well? Um, reality is good stuff. I think God is a God of reality. And when we strip away the illusions and get closer to that reality, as challenging, difficult life experiences force us to do, uh, we're actually better off in the long run. I, you know, I also think that the role of community in helping us do that is terribly, terribly important. It, my journeys have always uh, required solitude on the one hand, but community on, on the other. This great paradox that, that Dietrich Bonhoeffer pointed to in his remarkable little book called Life Together, where he said, let the person who cannot be alone beware of being in community, and let the person who cannot be in community beware of being alone. We, we need both of those dynamics in our lives, especially in the challenging times. Right. And, and you, um, you know, when we talk about community, I'm wondering if it, if it, if it is a bit of concern for you, a bit disconcerting to, to see um, a trend, although the trend seems to be reversing to, in some places, of, of bigger and bigger and bigger communities of faith, um, because that can really add an anonymity that kind of robs us of... of um, uh, of, of some of the things that you're talking about, or, or being very intentional in finding a small community in a big place. Right, and I think some of the best large church yeah. pastors and lay leaders have been very good about creating those cell groups or small communities. You know, I, I think, Chris, that my biggest concern about the megachurch phenomenon is how often it, it feeds um, the tendency for religious leadership to become a performance art and followership to be to to simply get reduced to the audience role um, I think that one of the things that that kills um, the church um, is this notion that somehow someone else has to do the religion for us or do the faith journey for us and we sit there as lay people observers of that um, benefiting as much as we can but not sort of actively engaged in the drama itself. So when religion becomes that passive act of showing up at, at good theater, um, I think something very, very important is lost. And I actually think that that's one of the reasons for the decline in church membership that we were talking about earlier. I, I think that, I think it's a, it's a difficult thing to decode because um, I know that there are there are really um, uh, thoughtful religious leaders, ordained leaders, who would really like to invite uh, parishioners into more active engagement uh, with the drama. Uh, they, when they try to do so, they're met with resistance. They, uh, silently, at least, people are sort of saying, "Hey, we, we raise money and pay you a salary." to do religion for us. So why are you asking us all these questions? Why are you asking us to do it for ourselves? But I, I think beneath that, I mean, this is one of my theories about leadership of almost any sort, whether it's in a congregation or in a classroom. As a leader, you have to be very good at diagnosing the woundedness of the people you're working with. And one of the wounds that a lot of Americans in congregations and classrooms bear uh, is the wound of insufficiency or inadequacy. Um, they've, they've grown up in institutions which have sort of delivered the message that uh, you ought to sit still and listen to the experts. You don't have what it takes. You're an empty vessel to be filled with someone else's knowledge. But when you, when you can treat that wound, when you can help uh, people identify 
um, the, the depth of what they already know, the fact that they've been on a faith journey for a long time without maybe having a theological language for it, I think good things can then start to happen. You, you you started us off on the topic of leadership, which I, I would I would like to spend a little bit more time on, um, and uh, the 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 woundedness um, of others that good leaders are good at diagnosing. Um, the wound of inadequacy is one, but there are others too, aren't there? Uh, when we take this leadership um, role seriously. Yeah, I, I think I think there are. Do you have some particularly in mind that you'd like to explore? And well, I'm I'm wondering what you you know, and I realize you're not an expert in how congregations uh, um, you know function, but I, I am wondering what our pastors are, um, are are facing in terms of wounds that that you may um, suspect would be something uh, that, that they'd see. Right. Well, when it when it comes to pastors, um, I've I've had a fair amount of experience over the years, including recently doing retreats for pastors through the Center for Courage and Renewal, which I know we'll be talking about later. Um, and I, I think the the wound that keeps striking me, that is really so visible when you bring pastors into a safe space where they can start really talking about what's on their hearts and minds um, is, is the wound of loneliness, the, the wound of not having trusted friends with whom they can really level about how it is with them and how it is with their lives as religious leaders. Um, I think in a, in a congregation things get very tricky if you bring uh, lay people into your confidence as a leader. Um, you sometimes if you're honest, will start saying things that may rattle um, the lay people who think you've, who think you know how to pray, who think your faith is is like the rock of Gibraltar, clad, yeah. solid and absolute. And so many pastors say, you know, every Sunday I'm up there talking about things that I myself struggle with. Of course, part of the answer to that is I think having the courage to say this is a struggle for me and then having the the thrilling discovery that acknowledging your own weaknesses, uh, acknowledging your own struggles actually brings you closer to lay people who are having similar struggles in their own lives. Will it lose you a few people who are looking for that rock of Gibraltar to hang on to? Sure it will. But um, a lot of people will be glad to know that they have company on this on this dialectical journey of faith and doubt, or or faith and fear, um, I, but I think you're less likely to do that in front of a congregation if you haven't had the opportunity to sit with a circle of peers in a very safe space mm -hmm. and find out that you're not alone in these struggles. So this 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 problem of loneliness, of of lack of intimate peer friendships. Um, is not just frosting on the cake. I think it's it's a it's something that can undermine uh, some of the best forms of ministry as pastors walk around feeling their own sense of inadequacy and insufficiency to the task. Right, right. So then, um, leadership, and especially when we talk about it in 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 the parish, becomes a lot more effective when we. Um, and I think you kind of pointed it out when we uh, were talking briefly about megachurches, is that uh, if one is so far removed from uh, the daily lives and experiences um, and, and, and relationships, uh, because it, it's a certain amount of intimacy that we're, we're asked to, to disclose, and that's very difficult if people are strangers. Uh, you've got to have a relationship. Absolutely. And... And I, again, I think that, you know, in the circles that we offer for pastors through the Center for Courage and Renewal, yeah. where groups of peers come together who aren't serving in the same church with rare exceptions, um, who aren't even necessarily in the same denomination or doing the same kind of ministry, but they establish with the help of a facilitator the safety necessary to say what their lives are really like. That, that, they take that back to the congregation and something new starts to happen. Something opens in them um, that, that is about brokenness and imperfection. And as Henry Nowen, my dear friend, was 
fond of pointing out it's the wounded healer who's the most powerful healer. Uh, as Leonard Cohen says in a powerful song that he wrote called Anthem, um, ring the bell that still can ring, there's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. He says, give up your perfect offering, there's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. So I think these are things we learn in community with one another and then take back to the communities where we're called to service. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I want to back into now uh, the Center for Courage and Renewal because I, I don't know if a lot of our, our viewers are real familiar with it. And sure. so I wonder if I could just ask a few basic questions. First, uh, what is it and how did it come into, into existence? Well, the Center for Courage and Renewal is a small nonprofit whose headquarters is out in Seattle with a staff of six or seven people. But around the country, we have 200 very well-trained facilitators who have worked with about 50,000 people over the last 15 years. Um, I founded this thing in the early 90s with a pretty simple mission that's become elaborated since its beginnings. But the mission was to help people in the serving professions rejoin soul and role. Um, to, to sort of bring their, their true self, their own authenticity, their own identity and integrity more fully into the professional roles that they play. Um, we actually started not with clergy but with K-12 through teachers in our public schools because we felt that these were some of the most um, underappreciated servant leaders in our society and we wanted to give them a gift of appreciation in the form of a of a series of three-day retreats, eight three-day retreats over a two-year period, mm -hmm. which allowed them to come into community with each other to, to take an inner journey, to reclaim their calling as teachers, to reclaim their gifts as teachers, and to go back into those very challenging situations called public schools, mm -hmm. where we all know um, there are a thousand problems a minute that teachers have to deal with and kids who are precious to us but who are also not getting much support in other aspects of their lives. So from our work with K-12 through teachers um, and as it began to be visible and to become known and, and respected, we started getting calls from other serving professionals, uh, people in healthcare, people in philanthropy, uh, people in law, and then people in religious leadership as well. And the Lilly Endowment gave us a, a, a wonderful three-year series of grants to work with clergy, which we're now doing around the country. And so do you still work with uh, these, these different kind of cohorts of people in these different professions? We do, yeah. So we now have uh, programs in each of the professions that I've named as well as cross-professional yep. programs. Yep, yep. And then so uh, when, when clergy come up to the, the Center for Courage and Renewal, um, they're doing it, I'm guessing, because there's some sort of gap. There are a lot of independent churches where there is not um, anything formally in place that's very effective at building some of the um, building up in some of the areas you mentioned, um, but also in those in established denominations where uh, you know resources are thin and it's hard to rebuild those. Um, so I'm I'm suspecting you've probably heard some good success stories over the years from how ministries have been revitalized. Well, we have um, absolutely. I, you know, I think the problem with a lot of professional development programs, Chris, in all of the professions and and religious leadership is no exception. Yeah is that they're heavily based on tips, tricks, and techniques, right? right. The, these kind of external things we can do to tweak the situation or manipulate the situation, um, kind of wave the magic wand and make things happen. But um, I'm a big believer in the fact that um, whatever happens in the external world, for better or for worse, starts inwardly. It starts in the human heart, the soul, the spirit, whatever you want to call it. it it be, it's, takes root in human identity and integrity. I'm also a great believer in Thomas Merton's notion that God created each of us with a, with a true self, as Merton yeah. called it, and that over life, uh, over the, the, the one's lifetime, things happen that, that falsify the true self, that, yeah. that make it, it difficult for us to live close to that authenticity. In fact, Merton once said a thing that I think about a lot. He said, most of us live lives of self-impersonation, 
which I think is a is a powerful insight. Yeah. So we're 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 trying to help clergy get back to that place of reclaiming their authenticity, reclaiming their their adequacy, and indeed reclaiming their abundance, and realizing that this requires them not to shut down and mask themselves or hide out behind their role, but it actually requires the opposite of opening themselves to their congregations and of creating those more intimate relationships that you were talking about earlier, making this more of a shared journey than an expert delivering information or let alone faith to people who don't have it. And what we've found in these circles of trust is very simply that as the clergy we work with have this experience with each other and start to realize, I'm not alone in this. This is, you know, as, as I like to say to people when, who come to me and, and say I'm struggling with depression, I like to get to the point of being able to say to them, welcome to the human race. This is part of what it means to be alive on the face of the earth. And it doesn't make you exceptionally cursed in any way. It actually gives you an opportunity to become more compassionate and more connected with other people. So this is what happens to our clergy. And therefore, the stories of renewal aren't dramatic so much as they are deep, uh, one by one by one in ways that really create ripples in communities. Something new is happening here. Um, and I think it is a lot like uh, See How They Love One Another, uh, which was the, the dynamic of the early church that gets so easily covered over in, in our day of sort of showtime yeah. Um, religion. Yeah, and, you know, and I do wonder if uh, we're going to see a resurgence of uh, smaller churches, of more intentional um, communal experiences uh, around faith, simply because uh, you don't have to go to church anymore. Um, nobody's going to make fun of you if you're at Home Depot. The generation where uh, it was an obligation or, or, or a sense of uncomfortability came across one's mind because one wasn't in the place they always were at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning. I do wonder if there's going to be an intentional, um, you know, although smaller, um, and vibrant uh, sense of community by those that are forming and rebuilding right now. Yeah, I agree with you on that. And I think, on balance, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, you know, I've, I've studied social movements a great deal, and of course, Christianity in its heyday was a social movement, a, a prime example of one. And social movements are always animated by these small communal cells of people huddled together against the principalities and the powers, um, projecting a vision of possibility that's hard to achieve in the majority world that a lot of people don't see or believe in or want to contribute time and energy to. And I think that that's actually a very bracing experience to have. Um, and that there's a, an important sense in which some of the healthiest congregations or churches I know, or churches which, which, re, which re, retain this movement quality, are actually churches that, that raise the bar on what it means to belong to this church, rather than lower it to the point where you know the admission ticket is basically free. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of this wonderful group in Washington, D.C. that I used to hang out with when I was a community organizer there called the Church of the Savior, started by a remarkable man named Gordon Cosby. Well, to this day, the Church of the Savior in Washington, D.C., if you want to join it, you tithe money, you tithe time, and you join not a big congregation, but a particular mission group to which you feel called. Mm -hmm. And those missions include things like helping unemployed people in Washington's inner city find decent jobs, helping homeless people find housing, um, et cetera, et cetera, addressing immediate social conditions, working with kids who don't have at-home parents very many hours of the day to make sure that they have some sort of adult mentoring and caring in their lives. So when you join the Church of the Savior, um, you don't sign up to just show up when you can. 
on Sunday morning and listen to a sermon and then go home. You s sign up because you feel called to a particular mission. And I, I believe it's still the case that they don't let those groups get any larger than X. I'm not sure what the number is, but it's not very big. I would guess it's under 50 yeah. uh, because they realize that beyond a certain size, you start losing that sense of corporate calling to a shared mission. Sure. And I mean, you know, it, what you said, I mean, you could remark in a, a million different ways. Well, the first is that nobody signs up for anything anymore. Um, but the, <laughs> the second is that, you know, it, it, you, you know, your heart goes out for folk who in their spiritual journeys are, you know, are, are desiring a certain kind of community and a certain amount of depth. And, you know, I, and, and I think pastors grapple with this a lot, though, at least those in my small circle anecdotally. Um, with, with, with wanting to, to you know to, to see the hunger take off and the spark take off and and we're just reminded of the gift of faith that you know it, it's it's a gift and and if if the folk who come on Sunday are possessing it in very different quantities and at their very different path points on their spiritual journey um, you know to what degree by you know having people sign into things and you know and take on these burdens. Uh, these burdens, these, these responsibilities, we we then you know are are not able to you know meet them where they are. I mean, it, it's it, it's I think pastors grapple with that. Right, absolutely. There's a wonderful outfit uh, down in Atlanta called the Fund for Theological Education that is working on this this model that that they uh, name as calling congregations, and these are congregations that. Um, have, have learned the skillful means of helping their members discern their callings, their true callings, um, a little bit along the line of Frederick Beekner's famous definition of vocation, uh, which he always said was the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. And by gladness, I don't think he meant, you know, anything giddy, or that it makes you happy all the time, but he meant fulfillment. He meant a, the sense of satisfaction of showing up in the world you know, with your true self and your true gifts and deploying all of that in the service of what's near at hand, of what you feel able to meet, the needs you feel able to meet. So there are ways of, of, of calling people to those um, that particular point of intersection between their giftedness and the needs of the world yeah. um, that that I think we, we miss in many congregations as we fall into this older model of assigning people mm -hmm. to standing committees and then, you know, struggling to find a few warm bodies to sit in these chairs and make these decisions, um, which is one of the things that's just not working very well anymore. But I think in every human being that I've ever met, there's a desire to show up in the world as your true self and to be of service. I, I actually, you know, can't think of a sadder way to die than with the thought, I never showed up on this planet as myself. Yeah. Um, I was always holding back or hiding out or in some way hedging my bets. Um, people want a full body immersion experience of life. Um, and, and I think that these calling congregations that the Fund for Theological Education is helping to prepare, especially in the black churches that they work with, but others as well, with a real focus on young people who have this hunger in spades, um, is, is one way of stepping into this opportunity and this need. You know, there's an interesting uh, book title, and I, I've got the book, I haven't read it yet, called The uh, Juvenilization of American Christianity. Mm. Uh, and, and I suspect it's, it's about, at least according to the reviews, that it's about how our, our sense of adult adolescence uh, as a greater society has kind of gone into the church. And when you talk about vocation and we talk about finding our gifts, I mean, we're asking people to grow up, aren't we? And that can be very countercultural. Well, absolutely. I mean, I think I, I need to look at this book. I hadn't heard about it, but um, I think it's, it's absolutely right. A, a kind of even infantilization 
of people in in the religious community. And if you you know if you if you trace that back to its roots historically, I think sadly it had to do with with the church becoming an instrument of political power. And if if you could convince enough of the laity that all of the knowledge, all of the wisdom, all of the direct channels to God were in the hands of a few or approved, ordained experts, and then then you would have control over those people's lives. They would they would hand over to the experts uh, critical decisions about their lives, um, and equally so when when you flip it over, they will blame the leaders. <laughs> For everything that's wrong, the way an adolescent blames mom or dad. Um, so yes, I do think we're, we're, the call here is for people to grow up. You know, Thomas Merton uh, has long been one of my heroes. I never met the man and I didn't even really discover his writings until the year after he died. But um, I've read so many of his books that I sort of feel like I knew him. and. He, in the last talk he gave just before his death, which was a talk in Bangkok uh, to an international gathering of monks, Eastern and Western, um, he said, he, he talked to the monks about the fact that he said, we've given over too much to the authorities in our traditions. And he said, from here on out, men, and he was talking to an all-male audience, from here on out, men, it's everyone on his own two feet. Uh, you know, I don't think he was about to walk out of the monastery I, uh, at all. I think Merton valued community and its disciplines very deeply. But it, he, it was his language for saying, we got to grow up. We have to take responsibility for our own lives. And the more we can take responsibility for our own lives, the healthier our communities will become. Um, com you don't make community out of people who are sort of folding into each other yeah. and entangled with each other in unhealthy ways. You may, in, in an interesting way, you make community who are out of people who are standing on their own two feet and who can say freely as adults, I need you, you need me, we need each other. That's, that's a healthy community. And I think that's what Bonhoeffer was getting at when he said, let the person who can't be alone, that is, who can't be on his or her own two feet, beware of being in community, and let the person who can't be in community beware of being alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we, um, uh, we, we talk about forming healthy communities that, um, uh, as I, I think you've mentioned earlier, uh, they are enlivened and invigorated when the depth of intimacy grows deeper. Uh, and when deeper relationships are cultivated. And yet at the same time, uh, Parker, we're facing a time when the average person going to church, their frequency level is much less. Um, right. That, that we, and and it, doesn't it take some investment to, to be able to build that intimacy? And I, I wonder what, what you might, uh, from, a, a, you know, a, from your vantage point, uh, what you might see as ways that, that, that we might help build, um, build that intimacy in congregations today that are you know, behaving the way they are. Well, I think we've touched on part of that, Chris, already, which has to do with getting over our obsession with size. Mm -hmm. um, because the more we can come to terms with the fact that, that w you know, we may be in the process, especially in the mainline traditions of becoming a remnant church, then I think the more we're going to start focusing on, okay, how, what's the healthy way for small groups to operate? I, I think the, the, the key to this, well, I, I can't attach a lot of methods to it because I've seen it done in a variety of ways, but I think the key to this is, is, is helping, is giving people an experience where the return on the investment of time is significant enough to justify it in their lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, we all know in our own lives that there are certain things we do that just feel like um, like no return investments on our time. We're just expending ourselves, expending ourselves, expending ourselves. And then there are other things that we commit to which are so rich and so deep and so engaging that suddenly 
we find that they enhance our our time. They make our days longer. They make our life's life richer and deeper. Um, they actually open up possibilities rather than precluding or closing down possibilities. Um, you know, when we started out uh, doing the work of the Center for Courage and Renewal, and we said to people, our basic model is eight retreats of three days each over a two-year period. And we were saying this to school principals, school teachers, clergy, physicians, etc. A lot of people said, are you nuts? We don't have that kind of time. We Give us the mountaintop experience, um, you know, three days, Friday afternoon through Sunday noon, and let us go home. And we said, no, we're not going to do that because we know that by Monday afternoon you're going to be off the mountaintop back in the valley of the shadow of death, right? right. Um, and so as people started actually buying into this and saying, okay, we'll give it a try, they found that this investment of time actually enriched their lives rather and, and added to their energies rather than sapping them. So I think, I think there's a whole lot of answers to the question, well, how do you structure a group or what kind of process do you create that actually enriches lives that way and gives people a return on investment, which a lot of our ways of getting together don't do. Um, in, in, in the work we do, I mean, one of the things that we bank on, for example, just out of, uh, to take one thing out of many, we bank on a lot of personal storytelling. Um, to help people understand each other and more important to understand themselves. It, it's amazing how many people have never had an invitation to tell their story around significant questions of meaning and purpose. Um, what, what shaped your life? You know, what, what pointed you toward where you are now? What is it that you would like to reclaim uh, from that journey that has gotten lost 20, 25 years down the road from its point of origin. Um, that's just one example of, among many of things that people say, my gosh, why haven't I done this before with others? Why don't I do more of it uh, back home? Sure, sure. And, and I think uh, return on investment um, is, is, um, is not a bad way to look at it. I was talking to somebody recently, Parker, who said that... Um, they're a preaching professor at a seminary, and they said for the first time in 200 years, the average length of the North American sermon is going up. Huh. Um, and when we tease that out, um, it had to do with this idea of return on investment, that I, I'm not going as much as I used to when I, we went every week with your parents or whatever, um, but when I go, I, I need it to have some sort of return, that, that it seems that um, it, congregations are going to have to, you know, be more intentional about how they use that time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the basic question, you know, is this a life-giving activity or is it not? Uh, is it a net gain activity or is it a net loss activity? And, you know, we do a lot in all of our organizations that simply wear people out. Um, and and if we, if we want to take return on investment seriously, we, we, we've got to stop operating that way. Right. And, you know, I, I also wonder about this idea of transformation. Um, because certainly at, um, at the core of, of, of most religions that I know of, I'm no expert, but certainly of Christianity is this idea that, you know, we, we're going to c come and leave changed. And, and as I, I look at, at, at the evolution of Christianity and I see, you know, Oprah and Dr. Oz and some of these other um, uh, people who are, uh, and not just people, but venues in which transformation becomes accessible to people, there's a certain amount of envy that, that you know, our, our you know, movement was started by somebody who was interested in seeing society and lives and the world transformed. And I'm wondering what, what we need to be thinking about as church leaders, uh, as, as faith community leaders, in terms of finding ways to bring transformation into our communities. And I wonder how you might comment on that. Yeah, well, you know, I think, I think transformation is um, a long-term process and an unending process. So 
I'm not real fond of, as I said, of those mountaintop experience models uh, or of the buzz you get from being in the presence of a charismatic personality, which lasts only a while. Um, I, I think it's more important to bring people into their own authentic presence and then to help them carry that back um, into the places that they occupy day in and day out when, when they're not in church or, or not setting time aside for a retreat. So one of the things that we work on hard in the retreats we do through the Center for Courage and Renewal is the whole question of if you're a physician and you've, and you've gotten back in touch um, with your Hippocratic Oath and how seriously you take it and that part of you that really wants to be a healer and not simply a functionary yeah. in, a, in a medical machine. And if you've gotten in touch with the fact that the HMO you work in uh, create, ha, has established boundaries and conditions that have you right on the edge of violating your Hippocratic Oath three or four times a week, which doctors in safe spaces will, will tell you. I mean, hospitalization is the sixth or seventh or eighth leading cause of death in this country, um, uh, proven fact, um, because of medical errors and so forth. Um, if you've gotten in touch with all of that, what can you do when you go back to the workplace to start bearing witness to something that everybody knows but nobody's talking about? That can, that can be a revitalizing thing. I mean, I think a lot about the number of folks in our churches who, who work in the world of high finance and who some of whom were severely troubled by what was going on prior to 2008 when the economy went into the tank and continue to be severely troubled by what's going on today. So what are, what are we doing that helps transformation happen, not simply inwardly and personally, but vocationally, mm -hmm. to help people bear witness, not, you know, not set themselves on fire or lose their jobs or blow the institutions up, but bear witness to new possibilities in, in the family, in the neighborhood, in workplaces, in all of the places that we inhabit when we're not at church. I, I do think that, that, you know, somehow one of the missing pieces in, in the whole church renewal movement is the ministry of the laity. Um, which, of course, is a, in, in, in my mainline Protestant tradition, is a very big and important idea. I'm a Quaker, as you know, Chris, and um, Quake, I happen to come from that branch of Quakerism that has, that has no clergy, no ordained clergy. Everything is communally based. This was the primitive, original form of Quakerism starting in England in the 1650s. Well, there's an old Quaker saying, we are accused of abolishing the clergy, but it's not true. We abolished the laity. Uh, and and I, I think the notion in a Quaker meeting, not that we always live up to it, far from it, but the notion is that everybody gets empowered for ministry. And while some of that ministry is within the meeting itself, which is the Quaker word for the local congregation, um, a lot of it is back in the workplace and in the home and in the civil society and in places where people um, need to experience that transformation and that revitalization uh, if, if the church experience is to be genuinely meaningful in their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this idea of, of marrying really the you know, Monday through Friday with Sunday, to use that metaphor, but of, of really helping people see their vocation as, I mean, you know, at the, Courage, at the Center for Courage and Renewal, where you, you spotlight on kind of those serving professions, where it's doctors, it's teachers, it's clergy, um, but you also mentioned lawyers, uh, which, who take an oath also. Uh, but there's so many folks who think that, you know, well, it's just, I'm just making money to put food on the table, and that there's nothing more to that when it comes to checking people out at the store that I do or managing this staff of people at a manufacturing plant. But I, I think what you're getting at asks us to look deeper into those places as 
uh, as vocationally, you know, charged ways to to to, to renew the rest of our, our our lives and work. Yeah, absolutely. I, I grew up with a, a dad who was, was in business in Chicago. He sold chinaware and silverware. Not a glamorous job, but my dad was a, a, a profoundly fulfilled man because he saw his job as as not simply selling chinaware and silverware, but conducting honest relations with his customers, um, entering into meaningful relationships with his colleagues, and helping to grow people at every point where he came in touch with them. And he got a lot of that from the Methodist Church in which I grew up and in which he had grown up back in Waterloo, Iowa. Um, you know, he, he came to business with the notion that this is about more than earning a living. And I, and I think that's what a sense of vocation is. So I've never been one to think that vocation has to be anything, um, you know, that requires a PhD. Um, my dad didn't even have a college degree uh, or to be in any sense of the word fancy. Um, I, 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 I sometimes drive down from Madison to Chicago where my sisters live and I go through the toll booths on the Illinois Tollway and every now and then I'll come across a toll booth worker who has a smile on his or her face, who greets you, who passes a joke just in the you know 15 seconds that you're driving through and I, I drive away thinking there's a happy person, there's a fulfilled person, there's a person who's making meaning in a situation where I would have a hard time doing it and I have great admiration for those people. I, I think it's possible in any line of work to understand that questions of meaning and purpose are not, are not at all ruled out. Well, you know, as we end our time together, Parker, um, I, I would like to ask one final question, which has to do with what um, what you're doing now, uh, which um, you know is, is you're addressing uh, you know clergy and Christian leaders. Um, it, what's the word from the Lord that has been recent to you? Uh, what has been coming across your your mind and your desk and your computer screen as something that's vital and life giving that you might share with us? Well, a year ago, Chris, as, as you know, I came out with a new book that's called Healing the Heart of Democracy, mm -hmm. um, subtitled The Courage to Create a Politics Worthy of the Human Spirit. And this has been, um, uh, as you can imagine, during this past election year especially, but it continues even today, uh, has been a, my own form of um, immersion, in, immersion in life mm -hmm. uh, over the past 12 or 15 months. Um, the Healing the Heart of Democracy is all about how we as citizens uh, need to re-engage with one another uh, in a life-giving form of civic community mm -hmm. um, in which we conduct civil discourse. But by that, um, I, I'm not talking about a problem that's going to be solved by watching our tongues as if, as if Miss Manners had the answer. We're, we're, the civil discourse we need is, is going to come instead from truly valuing our differences and realizing that it's in the dialogue of differences always that this society has progressed. Uh, just the other day I saw the new Steven Spielberg film Lincoln and it's a powerful message about the dialogue of differences around the critical issue of race in our society and how Lincoln, who held those tensions so magnificently, um, was able to help us move ahead on that. Um, let me just say that, that to me this is another area where church renewal and, and the renewal of the laity can, can happen, namely in finding ways for the church to re-engage political or civil society questions that isn't partisan, that doesn't violate church-state uh, the wall of, of separation between church and state. Um, quick example, the Wisconsin Council of Churches, I live in Wisconsin, um, uh, several months ago launched what they call a season of civility project. Mm -hmm. And working with my book and with folks from the Center for Courage and Renewal, um, they've trained about 400 facilitators around the state to host 
life-giving, constructive, small group dialogues between people of differing political opinions, mm -hmm. um, not only within the congregations, but between the congregation and the larger community. And when word of this project started to get out, a number of other groups, I think for the first time in the Council of Churches history, came to the council and said, as Jews, as Muslims, as Buddhists, uh, as folks of the Baha'i faith, as Unitarians, we this is important stuff to us. We want to join with you in it. And so in the book, I talk about five habits of the heart that we need to be cultivating in order to hold our political differences in a life-giving way. And representatives from each of these traditions took those five habits, translated them into the language of their own tradition, accompanied with texts from the tradition that support that particular habit, and uh, those are all now available as PDF downloads on the Wisconsin Council of Churches website, where if you go and look for a project called A Season of Civility. Mm -hmm. I got an email today from the head of the Wisconsin Council of Churches, which said, this has been a phenomenal thing for us. Um, it's revitalized us, and we think our, some of our congregations as well, and some of our lay people, in ways that you know have taken us way beyond this this old business about what ought our posture to be on issue X, mm -hmm. and have gone instead to these infrastructural issues of how do we create a civic community that has a capacity to call this democracy back to true north. Uh, a democracy that was based on we the people, but where we the people aren't operative if we don't know how to talk constructively with one another. And then we create a void, which is exactly what we've done over, over the last couple of decades, into which non-democratic powers like big money are eager to rush. So I think there are so many ministries, depending on local uh, exigencies, needs, callings, possibilities. So many ministries from vocational to political to personal that could help revitalize both congregations and individuals. It takes a discerning leader to know where do I point uh, us in, in this great mix of opportunities? Um, where, where do I get in a way, maximum return on the investment of the heart, on the investment of the mind, on the investment of the energy of the faith community, mm -hmm. um, so that people feel that that this is that this calling of theirs um, is is not only enriching the lives of other people but enriching their own lives as well. Parker Palmer, author and speaker, and. Um uh, thank you so much for uh, joining me and being my guest here on Church Next. Thank you, Chris. I've enjoyed our dialogue a lot.